Today, we're focusing on productivity, which is a buzzword we hear a lot, but is a crucial component for successful dev teams. We wanted to hear from an expert who spends a lot of time thinking about this challenge, so we were lucky enough to have Catherine Kohler with us today to talk about how development teams can actually engineer productivity. Catherine is an engineering leader with over 25 years of experience in software across industries, including entertainment and finance. She's currently the Director of Developer Productivity Engineering at Netflix, focusing on making everyday lives of Netflix developers easier by providing the best possible experience for local development. Before this, she led engineering for the Science Initiative at Chan Zuckerberg, where her teams built tools and platforms for biomedical researchers with the goal of accelerating scientific discovery. Catherine also serves as a mentor and coach to underrepresented people within the tech industry. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you for having me. Amazing. Well, let's kick off with talking about what the role of a productivity engineer is and how is this different from a traditional suite role? Yeah, so productivity engineers build tools, infrastructure, platforms that your more customer-facing engineers develop on top of. So I've, I've said this a couple of times in, in other podcasts, but we're kind of the nerds nerds, right? <laughs> uh, and I think that we sit in a very unique position centrally within the organization where our customers are our internal developers. Yeah. And so we have a very close-knit feedback loop um, we're also customers of the stuff that we produce. So we're dog fooding our things every day. Um, so we know how developers think. Uh, we, we don't lower the bar in terms of overall customer experience, in terms of UI and things like that on our tooling. Although we do fall victim a little bit to dev art here and there. Uh, <laughs> and we rely pretty heavily on APIs and, and the command line interface. Um, yeah. Of course, but uh, so we're a little further down in the stack than, than most folks usually operate. And we have a very close partnership with our cloud infrastructure folks and our data platform folks. So that's where we sit. Um, yeah, we, we are different, but, yeah. but cool. But we're cool, so cool, but important. Yeah, and and you know, I think a lot of people often say that uh, productivity, pro people have a lot of ways of interpreting productivity. and. Mm -hmm. So for you, it sounds like it's a very specific, it's productivity for developers working at Netflix. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you think about productivity um, overall? Yeah, we are that higher leverage point. So if you start using something over and over and over again, or it becomes an ism of the organization, right? Like, ah, oh, you know what? This is how we do security. This is how we do performance and optimization. And this is how we, you know, connect with our services we start to pave out those general uh, use cases and tooling so that folks don't have to do that over and over and over again. So if you're new to Netflix or if you, you're new to an organization, you can bootstrap and get up to speed and start contributing code in your particular domain very quickly rather than having to write a bunch of boilerplate code, having to think about a bunch of considerations that aren't something that you're an expert in, right? So we do a lot of that abstraction and we hide away sort of those implementation details, um, which make sure that you can still develop pretty easily within the Netflix ecosystem. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And so there's a lot of the focus there on the experience of being an, a developer at Netflix and being able to sort of spin up and start your applications really quickly. Um, how much of productivity do you think is is that that impact on the customer where, okay, now the developer is able to write all these focus on feature development versus on that developer experience itself. So the actual qualitative feeling of working on the team. Yeah, I think it goes very hand in hand with each other. It's very interconnected. Um, the developer experience, if, if your tools are not enjoyable to use, if you have not created the right abstractions, if people are still bogged down in the muck and mire of implementation details where they have to reach out to help, where they have to you know, search through a thousand different varieties of documentation that may or may not exist, that's a terrible experience. So if we can keep that as frictionless as possible, yeah. then people can really focus on the day job, right? And so for our customers, that could be anywhere from front-end development to back-end development to you know, edge, et cetera. Um, we want them 
to be able to provide as much impact for their customers, which mm -hmm. are our shareholders and, and subscribers <laughs> right. as possible, right? Subscribers are our customers, shareholders just sort of reap the benefits of that. Uh, so if we are good at our jobs, then we're that, again, leverage point where our customers, Netflix developers, can have a tremendous impact right. on the work that they're doing. And you know, I've heard some folks say, oh, you know, a productivity engineer is worth 10 engineers. And I don't buy into that crap. I mean, that's ridiculous. That's a lot of hubris. But if we're doing our jobs right, then we can save developers so much time. And if they're spending their time wisely, which they hopefully are, and because everybody likes to be productive and successful, then they're focused you know, 90% of their day on delighting the customer as opposed to maybe 25% of the day because they're constantly wrangling tooling that doesn't play, play nice with each other, right? So I think they go hand in hand, um, the actual developer experience and the kind of impact that we can have uh, with our customer and moving the needle to yeah. throw out some manager terms. <laughs> no, we, yes. we gotta have that jargon in there. Laser focus, bias <laughs> for action. Metrics, yes. <laughs> focus, always. Oh, kill me, uh, yes. <laughs> no, but this makes a lot of sense. And I think too, um, it sounds from an organizational point of view, having your team be the centralized team that works across all of the development orgs helps with that discoverability of those tools as well as probably with the standardization of yep. you know, the actual automation of those isms as you were talking about. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. But then, you know, speaking of that diversity of your user base, of course, each team has their own use case, their own frameworks, their own languages and tools. And so you're creating certain paved roads as, a, as I've heard you call them, Yeah. which yes, maybe there are some teams that can use the same paved road, but maybe they don't apply to others. So how do you think about balancing these a la carte requests, if you will, with creating more of a generalized common engineering experience? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, we are sort of the victims of our own success in terms mm -hmm. of tooling proliferation. And uh, I would say we look like a pretty busy map of <laughs> like take a nice metropolitan city without yeah. a ton of highways. Oh, and okay. not that highways are great uh, from a from a like a you know a neighborhood planning perspective. But in terms of the paved road or paved path concept, we need to get more people onto the super highway that yeah. has them, you know, be able to get from one place to the next pretty easily. And right now, unfortunately, we still have a lot of side streets and some streets <laughs> that don't go anywhere. <laughs> uh, or, so, or streets that only, only the developer knows about. <laughs> exactly, no, exactly. Only the person who lives on it knows Double about. extra secret streets. Uh, <laughs> So we are going through the, the process of paving more um, with, you know, water permeable paving that's good for the planet, paving more for our users, connecting those experiences together. We have two primary uh, languages that we leverage at Netflix, and that's Node and that oh, Frameworks and Java. Um, we don't have so much paving around the other languages. And we yeah. want to make sure that we have a multi-language story so that those folks can get the support that they need and around build, package, publish, security, mm -hmm. performance optimizations, et cetera. But for the two frameworks in which we are most focused right now, we still are sort of paving and connecting the experiences so that you can come in and have a seamless you know, build it, bootstrap it, build it, test it, deliver it, yeah. manage it when it's out the door, right? Um, so that that is really tricky uh, because once you've grown up and you sort of let the cat out of the bag and you have all these disparate experiences, how do you tie it together so it doesn't right. feel like a Franken solution? Right. Uh, so we're, we're still going through that right now. And that means more curation Mm. more abstractions. And you mentioned this earlier in your question, we really should be going, we should be going off of use case driven, mm. uh, you know, work. So let's take a persona, let's take a specific customer. What are the use cases that they need? And let's thread the needle all the way through the experience and yeah. make sure that that's a good paved experience. Cause otherwise you could end up going to 80% on everybody and it still sucks. Yeah. Right. So take those high leverage, business critical use cases, start paving them thoroughly, comprehensively, and then just, you know, approach it that way. Um, and 
over time and with a lot of sweat equity, you'll build out a, the, the true paved path experience. Yeah. And you mentioned that, you know, how do you balance a la carte versus whatever? I love really bad analogies. It's sort of my hallmark. <laughs> and so what, what I think a lot of productivity groups end up with is sort of the cheesecake factory experience oh. where you have a thousand page menu that's laminated and it's got all these different cuisines and you know, I'm sorry, Cheesecake Factory, don't sue love me for it, libel. It's, also, um, it's a novel to read through. It's a novel to read through and you know, no matter what you order, it's not gonna be that great, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. um, but if you can pare down those offerings and think of like a really nice dining experience where the menu is a la carte or you could go prefix if you want to, but it's all in a specific uh, type of, of cuisine. So no matter what you order off of the menu, you can share it. It'll work well with yeah. others, right? And then think of your productivity engineer as sort of the service. Uh, you don't want to have to interact with us too much because that means then something was wrong with the meal, something was wrong with the bill, right. something like something's off, right? Yeah. So you don't want to have to reach out to us. You just want to have a really nice experience yeah. and leave that restaurant feeling satisfied. Right. right? Like a guided experience. Exactly. A guided experience. We can give you the wine pairing right? if you want to, <laughs> right. or we can let you pick, but we're not going to give you something crazy. That's just like, right. or we're not going to like, have you like walking to the back of the storeroom to look at the different wine options. Exactly. We're not <laughs> going to send you to the farm, right? Exactly. Pick it yourself exactly. and bring, yourself. you know, we need you to go kill this animal yourself and bring <laughs> yeah. it in. And no, we're yeah. not going to do that. So okay. that's how I think about, you know, the whole experience um, and tying those experiences together. Yeah. sort of being very thoughtful and uh, right. about what we go after and those use cases that we're well, delivering and, on. And especially when it comes to dev standards and how to do best practices or how to the right process, so much of it is opinion driven and it's, well, this is how I've always done it. Therefore it is best practice. But when you actually extend that to that last 20% and say like, but does this truly solve the end state? Yep. Sometimes that answer is no, or there's yep. a different approach. Yeah, absolutely. Or say you're solving it for the super user. And this is a trap that we fall into within productivity and uh, within central engineering because our customers are engineers. So they're gonna be very technical. We're engineers. We let them config the heck out of everything. And so everything's exposed, like go for it. We give you the world, but really sometimes why not curate it for that 85% case? But then give people access to the configurations, things that they need for that 15% that you can't necessarily cover, right? So that's another thing to really think about. How do you balance that super user versus like the everyday user speed over, you know, you know, uh, fine grain Custom. control, et cetera. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that there's something to be said about the ability to have it all in one spot too. And so you can you can have more eyes on it than just if you were doing it on yourself. Yep, or if you're just absolutely. trying to duct tape something together. Yeah. And also like when you have a thousand different solutions, search and discovery on those is a nightmare. nightmare. How do you even figure out what the right tool for the job is? So and keep it of, simple. Yeah, exactly. And you, you're like, I want my infra person to tell me how to think about security in here. And, or I want them to figure out the really hard things and, and to have a platform like the one that it sounds like you've built at Netflix. Um, that allows engineers to just experiment with some of these processes too, right? And create these POCs that are much faster than, yep. oh, now we have to do all the investment in actually setting up the environment. Yes, exactly. It's like the separation of concerns, right? Exactly. It's it's the ultimate form of object-oriented development. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Not to and nerd so, out too much. Oh, my. wait, this is the spot to do it. Um, once we've actually created these tools and, and these paved roads, um, is user adoption a challenge for you? How do you make sure that within Netflix itself, people are using it? Yeah, it, it is a real challenge. And we don't have a very top-down corporate culture where we have folks higher up saying, you must do this, you must right. use this. This is the, the paved road or the highway, uh, <laughs> yeah. right? right. Uh, so we need to make sure that when we are building things that the story and, and the reality is compelling, right? If you move on to this, if you adopt this, if you migrate to this latest version or this newest thing, you know, what, what does that get you? Uh, luckily, I think a lot of companies went through log4j remediation uh, at the beginning of the year, which was yeah. this Java uh, exploit. Um, and for folks that, you know, within Netflix were on the paved path, it was a lot easier to 
deal with. Uh, and I think that's a really compelling argument for folks. Um, but you know, for other folks, like we're just fine using what they're using or right. they're, they're not going to get a ton of the benefits that we'll provide within productivity engineering, but also productivity engineering is going to be on the hook to support those things, mm -hmm. even if they're not something that we are actively developing. So it's in our best interests to make sure that folks have a great experience when they're using our stuff. It's within our, our best interest to make sure that we're aligned with the customer's needs mm -hmm. so that we build things that they really want and need. Yeah. Uh, and that's tricky business because people are really good at saying what they don't like, but not what they really, <laughs> what they, yeah, exactly. what they what, really what need, right? Yeah. Um, we, we've partnered, we have a, a product, uh, ugh, a product org, uh, we're product driven within productivity that helps us really align with the customer's needs to make okay. sure that the loudest voice doesn't win, that it's the highest leverage, highest impact um, thing that we can go after like strategically that, that gets our focus. Uh, and that's very helpful to stay super close to what the customer needs long-term. Yeah, no, that makes yeah. a ton of sense. Um, and briefly, uh, when you think about actually measuring the impact of developer productivity and these kinds of initiatives, in the past, I've heard you talk about measuring outcome over output. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you could touch on that, explain you know, what you mean by that, why that's important. Yeah, you know, it's it's easy to get into the activity trap as a developer. I'm pushing a lot of code. I'm hands on keyboard Perfect. all the time. Right. I'm just cranking stuff out, right. boom. Uh, and to what I mentioned earlier, if you're not actually lined up with what the customer needs, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much code you're pushing. That's fantastic. Uh, in some cases, like you could be writing more lines of code because you're sort of floundering, right? right. Uh, so I don't want to see activity. Uh, and, and, and although activity is a great signal, but it can go either way. So I want to make sure that we're measuring output. So what are those key performance indicators? What are those customer hypotheses that you you have around pain points and how are we solving them? And then making sure that we're circling back with the customer, either you know, through our own instrumentation and metrics or through you know, qualitative feedback. How's it going? That thing you were really upset about or didn't work well last time, like how's it going now? Do you find that you're spending more of your time working on the things that you're passionate about? And we can take away a lot of the isms, right? right. So right. that to me, I don't, I you you could work. Uh, very smartly on the thing that is highly aligned with the customer and, and not be in the office for 15 hours, right? right? Or right. you be in the office for 15 hours and be like, what's going on? Dude? Why, why are you, I know what, so, <laughs> so being very clear on that front and also incentivizing output mm. and not output, but outcomes. Okay. And so when you're taking a look at, at your teams and, and contributions and performance, you know, don't have the laundry list of things they shipped, yeah. but have the laundry list of how the thing they shipped impacted the customer. Right. And I think that's really important because, you know, what you, what you value as a culture on the team is what gets rewarded. hundred um, percent. Well, and it yeah. shapes productivity from being this competitive benchmark to compare people against each other. Oh man. To, oh, this is actually useful for us and for you as an yeah. individual and for the company as a whole. Right. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I love about Netflix and there are a lot of things like the culture is very strong and, and first and foremost, it's like, what's, what's the best thing for the business, right? Think beyond yourself, think beyond your team. What is the best thing for the business? What is going to move the needle there? And that really helps clarify and prioritize the work that we right. do. Oh, I love that. Um, the last thing, just to wrap up, any advice that you would have for, for people starting off in, in dev productivity, um, just new to this all? Yes. Oh, gosh. Uh, before you get too big, <laughs> yeah. don't build everything from scratch. Just <laughs> buy things off the shelf and tailor them and sort of tailor the work that you do in a way, because we're not as special as we think we are. Yeah. We become very special and bespoke the bigger we get. And the further away we drift <laughs> from sort of <laughs> infrastructure and things that are available. And it's not saying don't have a, a productivity team, like productivity teams are awesome, but be very smart about what you build versus what you buy and lean into buying as much as possible because you don't want to be holding the bag on a lot of things that have just drifted so much from what's now industry standard 
yeah. that you're stuck in that position of like, oh, do we tear it all down and go back to, to what everybody else is doing or like really figure out where you want to distinguish yourself in terms of like business logic and IP and things like that. Right. And that's what you build. Yeah. But all the other stuff, there's so many great companies out there that are doing this stuff for <laughs> so you. Why are right? we building source management? Exactly. Don't, don't do it. Control. I know. Don't yeah. do it. Gosh, if you had the time machine to go back and be like, oh man, I should have, we should have yeah. just put the money down on that early. Okay. Um, yeah. Lean, leaning into open source, leaning into more enterprise solutions where you can, uh, I think can really have a huge impact on the amount of productivity teams can have from the beginning. Wow. Right. Yeah. So yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Well, that is wonderful advice. Thank you so much for joining us today, Catherine. You're so welcome. Thank you.